So we've been kind enough to be invited into Shaky's garage. And I, I, I like the fact, Shaky, that on this side, it's fitness. And on this side, you look like a motorcycle dealer. Because <laughs> they're all stacked really close together. Well, they're not usually here. Um, I had these bought in because obviously I knew you were coming and, and I wanted some bikes here that, that meant something to me. And, you know, obviously these two, we've had a little bit of success with a couple there that I really like. And then some of the others are like dream bikes. I think the, the PW50 lives here permanently pretty much, maybe the RGV as well, but- um, They're the only bikes that live here normally. Pretty much, yeah, because all of the rest of them stay away. Um, and I like to be able to, at times, be able to put a car in here. So it's, it's always a little bit tight and it's yeah. not the biggest of garages, is it, so? No, but it's great. It's great. And, and, and are these, well, we'll go through the bikes in detail, but are these all your bikes? Most of them, except this one. Um, this one belongs to a good friend of mine. Um, started off as a sponsor, actually. He came on board and sponsored me in 2018. And then, um, obviously, that didn't last very long because I hurt myself in 2018. And yeah. then, yeah, we became good friends. And, yeah, he bought the bike at the... Uh, he bought this at the end of 2016, I think. Um, so I just won the championship on it. And he bought it from the team. And... He has a really nice collection of bikes and stuff like that. So um, he was like, yeah, I'll have that. I was like, radio. So <laughs> now I get to uh, get to have it in here. I took a load of pictures the other day, actually, when I picked it up yesterday. I, uh, I brought it back and I was like, oh, giving it a bit of a polish and a you little look around. Out. And yeah, I did. <laughs> I, sh I shouldn't have done really, and you perhaps better not tell him, but um, yeah, I did. I couldn't resist. Um, yeah, a, a lot of fantastic memories with this one. Right, this side, let, before we talk about the bikes in, in, in detail, so A, I know you're interested in cars. I know you have a vast amount of cars um, over the years. You must have a pretty impressive CV because you said you don't take an enormous amount of pictures of them, but you've had a lot of cars. Yeah, I, I, I love cars. I, I love anything with an engine, to be fair. Um, I really enjoy cars. <laughs> but then right now all I actually own is a Mercedes Vito van so <laughs> really I, I have nothing um, nothing nice at the moment um, you said you'd sold your 911 just before was it Christmas or not long before we started talking yeah um, I had a nice 911 um, I'm terrible right I, I spend all of my time first I decide I want something and yeah. then I'll try to find that car, right? And then yeah. when I find that car, I want it in that color. And then it has to have these options and then it has to have this. And then ultimately the biggest hurdle is the, is the price, right? Because I'm really tight and, and <laughs> I, want to, uh, I want to get a great deal on everything. So then I'll find the car and then it'll be like five, 10,000 pounds too expensive. And I'll spend a load of time trying to break down the, the seller and be like, oh, look, I can only do this. I've got that much. I'll, I'll pay for it. You know, it's not finance. I'll, you know, I'll do whatever. Yeah. And then if I ever, all the stars align and I get something, I think, yes, I've done it. And then I'll take it and get my detailer guy to clean it all up and make it absolutely like brand new. And then I'll drive something a few times and I'll be like, oh, why did I do this? Really? <laughs> yeah. And then I'll be like, right. Onto some of my dealership friends, I'd be like, right, I need to sell this. You know, do you reckon we can make some money here? Blah, blah, blah. And if I make a little bit of profit, that's me. I'm super happy. So it's the transaction, the chase is almost the most exciting bit. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I really liked, um, I really liked the, the Porsche. The, one of the biggest problems is here, because this garage is so narrow, can't get anything really nice in. Right. And when I have something really nice, I like to keep it really nice. Yeah. And, you know, the Porsche was all right in the driveway, but anything more expensive or nicer than that, they're not really meant to be left out. And no, yeah, you want to bring them inside and give them a polish, give them and, a worship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's about all I do with the RGV that sits here. And every now and again, I'll come out, I'll sit on the push bike, and I'll get off and I'll give that a polish off and then go back in the house, and, and that's it. But yeah, tell me about um, the fitness area here because. You casually mentioned that the, how much this bike's worth, which was a bit of a shocker for me because I was thinking that's probably worth more than all my cars. <laughs> no, it's but not. It's, 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 um, that, that's basically the bike that's won the, the Tour de France for the last, last few years. Um, ironically enough, it's just been superseded. Um, if you take it out of there, it's oh, super light. Cool. Um, you can hold it there, you just think. Oh my God, <laughs> that uh, just, just feels like a crisp packet. 
it's enough. And that's with its tools in it and its lights on and stuff like that. Oh, um, but work. yeah, it's just been superseded, so that might have to go soon because there's a there's a newer model out. Um, so I might have to try and see if we can get. And you there. really want it. Well, I don't, but you just have to have it, don't you? Yeah. At the end of the day, I, I don't really ride that much on the road anymore, um, just because I've still got you know loads of metal inside me and stuff like that. So I've been super, super careful, which is why I've got the, the stages bike there. Um, but yeah, it's always nice. Like when I when I do ride, it's like anything, right? If you if you've got to drive a long way, you want to drive in a nice car. If somebody yeah. said to you, "Oh, you've got to go to the moon and back," you wouldn't want to do it in a in a crap car, would you? You'd want the nicest thing you you yeah. could have. And yeah. I'm a bit like that when I do cycle or when I can cycle because I do it so often. I like to have a nice bicycle. It's I mean. Is, is the cycling thing always been with you since you were a kid or is it is it something you just is it a means to an end for fitness i think it has a number of things like i as a as a child you know we grew up when you went out and played on your bmx didn't you and you went and built a ramp and then you know five of your mates would sit there looking at this ramp and we'd, we'd be thinking oh we've made this a bit too big and i just <laughs> think you know what i'm just gonna have a go anyway because one, if I do it, I'm like a hero. And two, if I fail, well, at least I had the, the, had the guts to try. The guts to try, yeah. yeah. So um, I spent a lot of time on a, on a BMX as a kid, just, just sort of messing around and riding around. And my mum had no idea where I was. And I'd always be, you know, right over the other side of town or whatever, just, just playing around. But now, um, especially, especially since my accident and, and since lockdown, I think that... I think that lockdown sent sort of people one or two ways. You either kind of embraced it and used it for, you know, use that extra time that we all say we, we need so badly. Like, how many times have you heard, oh, if I only had the time to do this? Well, yeah. there was like a, a, a year and a half period where we were forced to have that time, right? And what yeah. was the first thing you did? I, I painted my garage. That's how bored I was in lockdown. But I also, I sat in here and just pedaled. So I probably got, you know, back up to some sort of level near maybe where I was when I was racing, just because I just constantly came in here to get away for two or three hours pedaling on Zwift and, and you know, that was that was me. He's just shown me off camera how many kilometers he cycled and you reckon just over two years? The last no, two maybe years? a little bit more than that, I don't know. But 25,000 kilometers. <laughs> That's, that's more doesn't than the mileage show, of all of those. Doesn't it show how bored I get? I um, I just sit in there and, and pedal. But you can lose yourself. You know, you can do. It's it's quite easy to, especially if you do a race. Because bear in mind that any any time you go on there, there might be up to like twelve or fifteen thousand people on Zwift at, at any one time. And if you enter an event that's got, I don't know, three hundred riders or whatever, and it's a hundred mile or hundred kilometer race or whatever it is. Yeah, that that kind of rolls along at like 25 miles an hour or something like that. So it actually doesn't take that long to get it done. So you might be, yeah. You make me feel very unfit. So go and just well, maybe maybe we should get you on there and see how you uh, see how you stack up. Oh bloody hell, bloody hell. <laughs> so you, and you got you, you got your treadmill or is that not yours treadmill? Is no, that that's the wife's. Um, okay. Petra's the runner in our family. Um, I actually bought that rowing machine in the middle there when I was when I was racing because. I wanted to, uh, you know, to do some work on my on my upper body and stuff, but now that's just uh, it's a little bit out of the question. Anything, um, anything from a strength point of view or anything like that, just Got just causes all sorts of problems. So um, just see, even I can't crash a push bike stationary. Do you know no, what I mean? Impossible. So that, that's what uh, that's what that's for. Um, so yeah, I just sit on there and. and lose myself maybe watch MotoGP when it's on or watch whatever's on on, on TV and yeah. have the Zwift on and away I go. Let's have a look at the smallest bike here over there I want to have a look. That is my son's first ever motorbike um, it's a little PW50 which as you can see has been it's well, dusty. well looked after yeah um, my son's really funny right because he has the i guess the ability or the potential to 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 ride whatever he wants or whenever yeah. he wants but yeah he's just not interested at all no not interested at all um in fact i bought him a a brand new motocross bike um i think it was in 2016 um a brand new 65 that sat in this garage brand new for about a year and a half without him even sitting on it he never even put his leg over it 
And then I just gave it to one of my friends who has a shop and said, just sell that because clearly he's, he's not that not that fussed about riding. So. Yeah. But that's cool. Um, so yeah. He's a nice kid and, and yeah, he has things that he likes doing. It's, it doesn't have to doesn't have to be me and there's no. got to be a easier ways to make a living as well so um well and yeah. like you say you you you, you do it, you do it it's born out of passion yeah that's how it starts and i think yeah trying to sort of force your hobby or your yeah. your interests on your kids is wrong the irony of it is that um from for me from a from a personal level like I was I was adopted in the, in the first place so at 6 weeks old i don't even know who my biological parents were but my mum and dad that brought me up never even had driving licences. But from the age that I would have been old enough to ride something like that as a kid, I never wanted to be anything other than what I was in the first place. And it was almost like it was kind of pre-programmed inside of me. It's like, there has to be a way for me to go and race motorbikes. I told my careers officer I was going to be a motorbike racer once at school and he burst out laughing. And was really? like, yeah, of course you are, sunshine, you know, but... It was, I, I don't know, like it, it had to happen. And How strange. I, I kind of made it happen. But like I said, mum and dad never even had a driving license. So where that come from, I have no idea. But Zach never never got it from my genes, that's for sure, because <laughs> he's not interested at all. <laughs> this is a bloody special thing, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, even I saw in your, your eyes, even you're excited every time you look at this bike. We had some good times together. Um, this actually belongs to one of my sponsors and I went and collected it yesterday. And uh, he said to me, oh, he said, uh, you'd be doing me a massive favour if you didn't bring it back until the week after next. And I was like, no problem. I'll keep, it. I'll keep it as long as you want. And the funny thing is, the first thing I did was I brought it home and gave it a bit of a polish and, and just sat there and I fired it up. I shouldn't tell him really, but uh, I he fired it up and kind of just left it ticking over outside. And I was like, oh, blimey. Like it, it, feels, it feels so fresh, Yeah, but it also it? feels so like a lifetime ago at the same time you know like so why why is that because of because you, because of the accident and the sort of rehabilitation yeah. process or <laughs> you, know, you know when the, the country got put into lockdown and yeah. like every day was the same wasn't it you know you'd, you'd go to bed you'd wake up you'd sit indoors you'd go to bed you'd wake up and you'd sit indoors <laughs> that's kind of been my life since since the accident so it's been like groundhog day constantly but because there's been no real defining factors. It just felt like it's gone on forever. Yeah. So to, to get this back home um, and, and to have it here was like, oh my God, this, this is my, I won the championship on this. I mean, I don't know if you can see, but even the, the confetti still stuck to the tires on the front from um, whenever we win the championship. Oh, they have the, the cannon. Of that's it, it fires all the confetti up and, and some of the confetti still stuck on the tires. And that's what those red squares are. Yes, exactly right. that. Um, still on the tires so you kind of you know think about the, the happy memories it bought and uh just think oh it's so so nice to have it to have it here um got the kawasaki here as well so the two bikes that i've had the most sort of recent successes on are both in the in the same place together so it's quite cool well is it, i know you you have a you seem to have a quite a high turnover of, of of sort of vehicles you can't keep settled but Stuff like this is a bit different. I mean, this is not a production bike, so it's kind of, this is extra special. The only thing I will say is that super bikes in general are derived from, from road bikes. Yeah. So, you know, they, they start life as the bike that, that you could go into the Ducati dealership and buy. Yeah. Um, you know, they'll, they'll buy, rather than buying a complete bike and pull them apart, normally they'll just buy the parts they need because there's so much from, a, from an actual road bike that they wouldn't use that it's, it's better for the teams to buy an engine and a, a chassis and a swing arm and then build up the rest as, as you know, as, as a race what? bike, if you know. The stats of this bike, what are the interesting stats? If you're talking to someone like me, who's, I'm not a total bike head, I do get bits and bobs of, of, of motorbikes and motorbike history. What's the, what, what makes this so damn special? Well, they are about 165 kilos because that's the, the minimum weight limit for, for superbike. Yeah. Um, it will do naught to 60. Uh, I think my best on it is maybe 2.4 or 2.5 seconds. Um, right. Is this the quickest bike you've competed on? No. It's not? No. Um, I spent a couple of years in MotoGP uh, in 2004 and 2005. And um, in 2004, in Catalonia, we got the Aprilia up to 211 miles an hour from start-finish straight. Um, 
it never ceases to amaze me, like from my days of being a, a tester back in in like the late 90s or yeah. whatever, yeah. just how much stuff's come on. Like I remember doing a track day at Brands Hatch and I never really do many track days at all. And this would have been maybe 2015 or 2016. But to feel how the development from MotoGP and World Superbike had kind of filtered down into the road bikes. I remember riding around um, Clearways at Brands Hatch on a 1199, 1199S or whatever it was. Not, not the super special one, but yeah. a, a real good bike. Yeah. And the traction control, as you're, as you're kind of leaning and like lifting the bike up, you kind of feel the bike like start to go, like the, the traction easing off. And I remember thinking, this is just phenomenal. And then fast forward a few years and, and got to ride that V4S the other lower last year. And, and it's just another level again. Now, like the, you know, when you, as soon as you pull away, you've used the clutch once, you don't need to use the clutch anymore because they have a quick shifter on the way up through the gearbox and a yeah. blipper on the way back down. Yeah. So it's, it's literally like pretty much like driving an automatic. As long as you can use the clutch to pull away, <laughs> they, they pretty much do everything for you. And, you know, the, the anti-wheelie control and the slide control and the traction control yeah. and all the systems they have on them now. The great thing about British superbikes, which obviously this is, yeah. is they have a control ECU in them. And the control ECU meant we had no traction control, no wheelie control, no control of anything, basically. So <laughs> ultimately, your traction control yeah, was your right hand. Things, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which makes for great racing. Obviously, it's not the fastest way around a racetrack because, you know, you can you can only go so fast. But yeah, yeah the, that's why you'll see BSB bikes kind of spinning sideways and, and, you know, the guys having a lot of fun on them because, you know, all 220-odd horsepower of this bike um, are in your right hand. That's a phenomenal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You can't get car exhausts to look better than motorbike exhausts. Motorcycle exhausts look so much better. Than, even supercar exhaust can't compete with this. That just looks so good. The sculpting of it, the angle. You wow. know, these, um, these exhausts um, on this bike were, were done specifically for me and my team because the 1199 Ducati that this bike was based on had exhaust that came out of the, the belly pan. So yeah. it, the thing was really compact, so none of that exhaust was there. But the the factory Ducati team in World Superbike at the time, they used a different brand. They used Akropovich. And yeah. um, because the, the noise limit in, in World Superbike is higher than the noise limit in BSB, they could run these kind of shorter exhausts that came out kind of Little halfway stubbies. up. I know the ones you mean, yeah. And we couldn't make the, the BSB bike so loud so we needed longer exhaust to try to take the the noise away yeah and that's how we ended up with with this system here because you wouldn't be able to legally race it with no. the shorter pipes. we raced it with the the original 1199 ones down there the first couple of races we did with the exhaust at the bottom but it actually made a lot more power um and the power was a lot nicer and not higher up in the rpm yeah with the with the longer exhaust so that's why we had them done now this is quite 90s i think it certainly this tailpiece is very reminiscent of the of the super bikes I used to see secondary school when they were brand new. So what's the significance of this? The significance of this and the significance of that is that you're absolutely right. This is a, a 1991 Suzuki RGV 250. And as a as a kid growing up and, and being into bikes, um, you know, loving everything motorbikes, I remember seeing a, a picture of this that was due out in 1991 in, uh, I think it was in like Performance Bike Magazine or something like that. Yeah. And I remember saying to myself, I have to have one. One day I have to have one of those. And I've actually had this for years and it went off to various places to be refurbished and and you know made made really nice it and then good. yeah really got good. kind of lost in the system if you like and then one of the guys that was the um the old team coordinator for the team that i used to race for yeah he restores a few bikes and and he ended up doing it and yeah i think i've done 97 miles on it <laughs> since, <laughs> since then and i think miles. i bought it in like 2006 or something like that oh wow so but it's a keeper you know it's like it? this this stays at home because you know what when i'm when i'm having a bad day you know what nostalgia is terrible right yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. if i went and rode it you know it's it's gonna be slow and it's nothing like a super bike and it's you know it's a 
two stroke, which is great. So it makes a really nice noise, <laughs> but the chances are it's likely to break down and whatever else. But yeah, that's, uh, that's what nostalgia is all about, isn't it? You know, going back to the days when you love something, but you know, I keep this at home and whenever I come out in the garage, you give it a little wipe off and just sit there and have a little smile. He was and just, just cleaning it off camera just before we turned it on. He said, I've got to give it a little wipe down. It needed it because it was a bit dusty. It's dusty in here anyway. I, I can't stand this garage. I need to, I need to sort myself out and get it. You need to up your garage game. Up my garage game yeah. massively. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's so needed. this, this, and the the, the two little ones, the, the pooch and the the Yamaha, they're the only bikes that stay in here, apart yeah. from your exercise bikes and yeah. stuff. Yeah, right. Um, the pooch is basically the first bike I ever got to ride was one of those at Butlins at Bognor Regis, um, <laughs> and yeah, one come up and it come up on eBay. I bought it off of eBay, and another guy who now does all of my kind of restoration stuff for me did that. Um, got it looking like that. It's it like, looks great. Yeah, it's like new. with your numbers on. Yeah. So um, they're, the, that, they're the seed sowers, those machines. Yeah. Because I remember a PW, a friend of mine, my oldest friend, Ed Taylor, his dad was obsessed with bikes when we were at primary school and we used to go around to his house and sometimes play. And his dad bought him a PW50. It was the first bike I ever rode. Mm. I thought it was the most incredible thing. It was white and with red decals. And it's funny, so I can. I can close my eyes and be back in his garden now and know exactly how you would avoid the rockery in the pond. Yeah. And he used to ride it like a nutcase and, and it's still trial biking and stuff, but it's those, these little things that are what, what starts it. Yeah. You've got here. a broad appreciation of bikes, I've noticed that. I know, that, I know you've, you've had most of your success with Ducatis, yeah. but you still have quite a, you're not, you're not afraid to have other marks of bike. It's kind of like some no. people are just dialed into one type. I've got, uh, I've got a Harley. Um, have you? Yeah, uh, I've had a few Harleys. Um, I would not have expected you to say that. Well, do you know what? The, the problem for me as a motorcyclist when I was when I was racing was that the minute I get on a bike, someone's got a stopwatch on me or got a camera on me. But fundamentally, I love riding motorbikes. Yeah. So, what what better bike than a than a Harley or a, a cruiser type bike? Yeah. To to go out and just actually still enjoy riding a motorbike on yeah like i love riding this but i know if i ever take it out it's going to break down or, or something's going to go wrong <laughs> um but you know a few of my mates we we have a few different bikes and and you know we used to pop out just go to a coffee shop or something grab a yeah. coffee and talk nonsense like we all do and then yeah. and then just kind of cruise back home again and it made me really happy so um so you stripped it back to the sort of the roots of the enjoyment because your day job is to ride as fast as you can hmm on a bike that that you know money can't buy most of the time so you you know you can't take that bike out on the road mm. you don't need to because you ride around circuits mm. so it's almost like you'd rather go the other way and just have something that just lets you chill out and yeah zone out i've Maybe. been looking at i've been looking at all sorts actually i i actually want to buy a bike now i don't want to buy one to be fair i want to try and get lent one but um, <laughs> <laughs> i actually was very something. honest very <laughs> yeah. honest man let's, let's be brutally honest here um i want to borrow something because i'd love to i'd love to take my wife and you know just go for a little potter about down to the coast or whatever, get us fish and chips for lunch and maybe ride back or whatever. And, and yeah. that'd be me happy again. You know, I think that, you know, we're not too far away from being able to, to jump on a couple of road bikes and just do that because, you know, yes, it's risky, but life's risky full stop. And Absolutely. I've spent sort of three or four years now being like, you know, living like I'm 120 years old. I want to, I want to live again and yeah. enjoy the feeling of riding. Come on then, Shaky. The significance to the layman uh, who might be watching this the significance of this bike well the signif significance of this bike is that um you know we won a we won a couple of championships together uh, <laughs> we won quite a few races together um and this is the bike as well um when pbm decided at the end of 2015 that we were going to change manufacturer to go to ducati um paul bird sold um fs3 who became the official factory team in the uk all of our stuff and you know they, they sold it as a package and what fs3 did was they took this actual bike which was my bike and they used it like um how could you say they used it like their their reference so yeah. all of the measurements were taken from it obviously all of my settings were in it they had all of my my data from from the years previous 
and they used all of that information to build their own brand new versions of, of this. And then this got pulled to pieces and, and stuck on a shelf. And then the, the FS3 guys, I, I remember speaking to them at one of the media days and they said, oh, you know, we've still got, we've still got your old girl sitting on the shelf, blah, blah, blah. And I said to them, well, you know what? If you ever want to sell it one day, just, just give me a shout. Yeah. And they said, uh, oh yeah, at some point we'll get around to building it back up. And the only thing that was different at the time was that it never had, you know, that all the body work was all stripped off and what have you. So I sent this body work to, um, to the, pipe, the, the painters who, who did the, the bikes for us, yeah. had it painted and, and that was it. Yeah, it was, uh, came home to daddy. <laughs> so yeah, how many races did you win with this? Do you know what? I don't know. Quite a few. Um, you know, I had some, some really good years because I rode this from 12 to 15. So I would imagine probably around 30 or 40 races I won on it. Gosh. Um, but the nice thing for me, that the provenance in it is that it, it is my my bike. You know, it's not yeah. one that's been painted like mine. It was, it, well, it is my actual it's bike. The and bike. Every now and again, I stick the battery on it and, uh, fire it up and, and sit there and get all excited and, and then annoy the neighbors and then turn it back off again i am i am a little bit of a, a softy when it comes to ducatis because i just think that they're, they're beautiful and, yeah. and purposeful and you know you you can make a, a great japanese race bike for sure and a japanese race bike you know won won the world superbike last year won well, won everything last year um yamaha won they had done a clean, clean sweep they did bsb world superbike and motor gp wow so there's no doubt in that japanese can can build good bikes yeah, but yeah i just think there's something a little bit special about ducatis yeah well don't it'll hear you don't, yeah i know don't, don't say, say that she knows don't, i love don't her don't say it's i did even give this a little polish just before we went on air just to you uh, did to make it look shiny you did yeah but, um yeah I was going to ask you about your number, by the way. Yes. You're 67. How did you choose that? It's an interesting well, did story. Did it choose you? No, it is quite an interesting story. Um, basically, the first time I ever done a, a World Superbike wildcard, um, or I did it in 2003, yeah. and to enter the World Championship from the Rich Championship, you had to, you were allocated a number. The number I was allocated in 2003 was number 67. And that weekend at Brands Hatch in front of about 120,000 people, I beat all of the World Superbike guys and won both races. I remember. Um, which, was, which was a pretty special day. In, in your home county? Yes. And the irony of it was that when I then signed to go to MotoGP the following year in 2004, and I couldn't think of a number to choose. And I have this friend, Jamie, who's, you know, not he's never going to be a rocket scientist to say the least and uh you know we've been racking our brains thinking about numbers for me and whatever else and he was like Whoa, why don't you use number 67 it worked all right last time you went in a world championship race and i was like that's genius <laughs> so uh, so we used it but then the, the slightly sadder part of it is that i lost my dad at 67 years of age and then after that it never changed so whether or not i would have stayed 67 because of the, the the MotoGP thing, I don't know, but all the World Superbike wins, I don't know. But uh, when Dad passed away at 67, I thought, you know what, I can stay there forever now. <laughs> it's a good number. I like it. Mm. I've noticed it's all on, on those leathers over there. They look eight. Have you ever been to a factory, a bike factory? I was going to ask you this. It's funny you should ask. I have, and uh, in said bike factory, in around 2002, maybe I think it was. A certain manufacturer were preparing themselves to enter, you know, the, the, the world of MotoGP. And they had this massive, and when I say massive, I mean massive banner hanging from the ceiling of a Desmo Sedici. Um, and you know when you set eyes on something and you think, I just have to have one. Yeah. If we're talking dream bikes, this is mine. Desmo Sedici. Desmo oh, Sedici. Oh. Mm. Who, who, it does sound like a name of a, like a, uh, a cabaret singer. Yes, <laughs> it does. It's, and it actually sounds a hell of a lot cooler than 16 valves, which is basically what it translates to in English. So uh, it does. Yeah. It does. The, the Italians have a, a certain flair when it comes to words, don't they? So you say 2002 time when you went to the Ducati factory? Yeah, I mean, they were they were getting ready to enter the, the MotoGP championship. And, you know, they just had this, I just remember seeing it, it was the race bike that they had 
um, which, which this bike was derived from. Um, they built 1,500 of these for the world. And Did they? Gosh. They, at the time, were like a, an extortionate amount of money, but they all sold really, really quickly. Um, this one is... What, what number Sorry, is I have to check. <laughs> 531. 531. Um, I've wanted a Desmo Do you know what? The funny thing about this bike is, this actual bike, as in the Desmo Sedici, yeah. is the only bike that my wife would let me take indoors because we were going to have one on, on display. Were and you? she said, there's only one bike you're allowed to have if you're going to have a bike indoors and it's one of these. And I bought it and now she won't let me put it in there anyway. So it's like, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so it's, yeah. It so goes, it lives it in, goes, in it goes, hiding in a unit somewhere. Yeah, exactly that. So what made this bike so special? Because it, it really was, or really is, um, you know, pretty much a copy of their of their MotoGP bike, and that was something that was was very very rarely done. You know, you couldn't go and buy, okay, you could go and buy an RG500 or a, or a Yamaha RD500 and replicate the old 80s 500 bikes, but they weren't like the Grand Prix bike, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, RG500 was more like um, like a modern day superbike, like the, the BSB bikes. You know, you basically started with a, a a road derived bike and then you took it to the track. Yeah. Um, but this was, um, or this is, fundamentally they're like 2006 or 2007 MotoGP bike, but sort of detuned enough that it'll actually Gosh. be able to be able to be ridden on the road. Um, this one has the, the, the Termignoni exhaust, the, the full titanium exhaust on it, and, and that alone is like a like a six thousand odd pounds upgrade. But six grand for an exhaust. It's a bargain because you get the seat unit, which is different because the, the standard bike, when the exhaust comes out, it comes out here. Yeah. And it doesn't have the, the side exit exhaust down the bottom. So you get the belly pan and the seat unit for that six grand. So it's not all bad. Sweet, sweet, <laughs> sweet. What I mean what it's a, it's 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 a, it's a naughty thing to ask, but what is this worth right it's now? It's difficult to quantify because, like like everything in life, it's worth what somebody will pay for it. Yeah. Um, the the most expensive one on the on the internet at the moment, I think, is seventy two thousand, maybe something like that. Gosh. Seventy grand. Gosh. Um, Gosh. You know what? I um, I've wanted one for so many years, and I did my um, I did my book a couple of years ago. And when I got one of the payments for the book, I was like, Do you know what, rather than just waste the money, I'm going to buy something that I always wanted. If you'd have asked me for the last 15 years, what's your dream bike? It was a, it was a Desmo Sedici or it is a Desmo Sedici. Yeah. Um, I can't ride the thing. You know, there's no point in, in using it really. But I think this has done a thousand miles maybe from new. Has it? Since 2000. I don't even know what year it is. 2007, I guess it is. Um, so it's done absolutely nothing, um, but it's in my garage. And, it's, I can look it's, at it. and it's like it's it's pretty enough for it to just sit and mm. exist. Exist. It does look magnificent. I have to say, she's a cool thing. 